This Brigham Young University devotional by Lavelle Edwards was given April 10th, 2001. On August 17th, year 2000, Lavelle Edwards announced he would step down as BYU's head football coach following the 2000 season, his 29th at Brigham Young University. During that period of time, he produced all but one winning season since taking over the program in 1972. During Coach Edwards' tenure, his teams won 20 conference titles, made 22 bowl game appearances, and won the national championship in 1984. He coached a Heisman Trophy winner, two Outland Trophy winners, a Maxwell Award winner, four Davy O'Brien Trophy winners, 35 All-Americans, 11 Conference Player of the Year recipients, and 32 Academic All-Americans. He led the Cougars to seven NCAA single-season passing titles, and especially recognized for coaching seven All-American quarterbacks, Gifford Nielsen, Mark Wilson, Jim McMahon, Steve Young, Robbie Bosco, Ty Detmer, and Steve Sarkeesian. He was labeled a national coaching treasure by USA Today. Coach Edwards led his teams to four top 10 rankings and 13 top 25 finishes. Coach Edwards earned his bachelor's degree from Utah State University, his master's at the University of Utah, and his doctorate at BYU. He's a well-seasoned man. He and his wife, Patty, are the parents of three children. An avid golfer, he also enjo enjoys gardening and reading. He is responsible for the expansion of Cougar Stadium, which is now a 65,000 seat, seat uh, facility, which is a credit to his accomplishments. It was renamed in his honor at the final home game of this past football season. We are privileged today to be able to hear from BYU's own living legend. I might say that Coach Edwards, one of the things that makes him remarkable, one of the tributes to him is that he was interest, as interested in the man as he was in the football player. So we will now look forward to hearing from Coach Edwards. I can assure you that I have given much thought and prayer to this assignment so that I could hopefully say a few words that would be a benefit to you this morning. It has been my pleasure and honor to be at this great university for the past 40 years. My interaction with the students have been mostly as a coach. I did, however, spend seven and a half years as a bishop and a high counselor in a student ward and state which I considered among the most enjoyable and rewarding church assignments of my life. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 20, or verse, or 27, verses 15 through 18, it reads, Lift up your hearts and rejoice, and gird up your loins, and take upon you my whole armor, that you may be able to withstand the evil day. Having done all, that you may be able to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about you with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of peace, which I have sent my name angels to commit unto you, taking upon the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darks of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of my spirit, which I will pour out upon you, and my word which I reveal unto you. We've all seen pictures of Moroni dressed in his armor, including the breastplate and the helmet. It's a little like a football player dressed in a full uniform with all the required pads, shoes, and helmet. They are both dressed for protection from their adversaries. The football player has all the with, has uh, to withstand the blocks, tackles, and other hits he will take while practicing or playing a game. The Lord has offered us protective armor to use in our battles, and that is what I'd like to discuss today. As the scripture states, we should have our loins girt about with truth. 
As members of the church, we seek truth in all areas, be it spiritual, educational, scientific, or in the social and moral settings of society. If we don't seek truth, we will not find it or recognize it. Probably the most profound search for truth was Joseph Smith's search for the true church. Just think where we would be today if he had not had that hunger for truth. In order to recognize truth, to be truthful, to be honest with others, we first have to be honest and truthful with ourselves. Self-deception is deadly. Deceiving ourselves leaves us open to Satan's ways. Like blaming others for our poor choices, justifying a little white lie, and cheating on a test. However, being honest with ourselves allows us to learn who we are and what we are all about. It helps our minds and hearts to be open to further truth and inspiration. Spencer W. Kimball in the September 1978 Ensign said, if men are really humble, they will realize they discover but not create truth. Close quote. We all know of the two plans of salvation presented by the God to his sons, Lucifer and Jehovah. A great battle commenced between their followers, and even though Lucifer was cast out, the war between the forces of good and evil have continued to this day. The temptation of the forces of evil are greater today than ever before. But truth can make us free of Satan's deceptions. The scripture continues, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness means being upright, moral, virtuous. It is something we have to work on every day. We have to keep progressing or we will regress. We have to continue studying, praying, and trying to live the Lord's teachings and commandments to gain and maintain a life of righteousness. I believe righteousness also includes service to others. A righteous person is aware of others' needs and acts on that awareness through service. We are in an era of dot-coms, computers, and the Internet. It is easier to get caught up in all these wonderful inventions and let them control our lives, forgetting about the world and humanity around us. Our human interaction, compassion, and concern for each other are far more important than technology in trying to live Christ-like lives. A friend shared with me this anonymous but profound creed that says it well. I quote, remember to be gentle with yourself and others. We are all children of chance, and none can say why some fields blossom while others lay brown beneath the August sun. Care for those around you. Look past your differences. Their dreams are no less than yours. Their choices in life no more easily made. And give. Give in any way you can of whatever you possess. To give is to love. To withhold is to wither. Care less for your harvest than for how it is shared. And your life will have meaning and your heart will have peace. Close quote. This is a beautifully stated philosophy. And one that I believe that we should incorporate into our lives as we continue our quest or righteousness. The next phase of the scripture is, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Preparation brings, brings peace as it frees us to pursue our goals. In this era of violence in every medium, peace is a treasured feeling and one we want to keep with us as much as possible. To me, uh, preparation is the key to success in any endeavor. I've often heard the phrase, he or she has a great will to win. What it should say is that he or she has a great will to prepare. 
The greatest athletes are not always the fastest, strongest, or the most gifted athletically. The greatest players are those who have the ability to recognize their potential and prepare themselves to meet that potential. On a Saturday afternoon in the stadium with a full house, the excitement of the band, the cheerleaders, and the crowd, a player can have all the desire to win and the, or will to win in the world, and it will be for naught if he hasn't prepared. The same is true in our personal lives. We can have the desire to do something well, even gain a strong testimony of the gospel. But it will be for naught if we are not willing to work, study, and prepare. Every one of us has the potential to successfully achieve our goals in life, but it can't come without an effort on our part. The next item of protection is taking the shield of faith. In the Book of Mormon, warriors use shields to protect them from the swords, spears, arrows, and other weapons of their foes. In football, the quarterback has an offensive line that forms a pocket in front of him to shield him from the opponents. Faith is our shield, our pocket of protection. It is our shield from the many weapons that Satan bombards us with every day, such as despair, indecisiveness, procrastination, depression, and anger. Faith lifts us up, gives us hope, makes seemingly insurmountable challenges possible. Life can be discouraging. It isn't always fair. But with faith and an eternal perspective, we can make it through the hard times. We tend to think that we're the only ones with problems, when in reality, everyone has problems. Even President Hinckley, when he said, my life has been rich because it has been filled with problems to solve and associations to savor, close quote. Sean Covey is the son of Stephen R. Covey of Seven Habits fame and grew up in our ward. He had those, along with his other family members, those seven habits stamped across their forehead from the day they were born. And they knew how to succeed. They were a marvelous family. Sean was a great high school football player and led his team to the state championship and was very highly recruited. It came down to us in Stanford and Sean elected to come to BYU because he wanted to lead us to another national championship. His freshman year, he did well with the junior varsity squad and then left on a mission. When he came home, he was excited and eager to resume his football career. He worked hard, prepared himself physically and mentally, and halfway through his sophomore year, he became our starting quarterback. After winning all but one of the last few games of that season, we played, and everything looked like everything was right on track for him. The next year, he was named the starting quarterback, but sustained a concussion against Wyoming in the first game. He came back the next game, and we beat a nationally ranked Texas team. But then he had shoulder and knee problems throughout the year. The team suffered a little bit, and he had to have surgery after the season, which prevented him from going through spring practice. At the time, we had a young freshman quarterback the name of Ty Detmer, who had an outstanding spring. It became evident that he may be the better of the two. But because Sean was the starter the previous year, we wanted to give him a good chance to fight for the starting position when they returned in the fall. After fall camp, it was evident that Ty was the better quarterback of the two. Before any announcement was made, I brought Sean into the office and explained our decision to him. He didn't speak for a while, but finally said, Coach, I don't think this is fair. I've worked hard, prepared well, and done everything I was supposed to do in retur to return as a starting quarterback. This is going to be a much better team than the others that I've played on. I had to agree with Sean. 
After another moment, he continued. But coach, he said, this isn't fair. But I want you to know that I will be at every practice. I will be at every meeting. And I will prepare myself every week as if I were the starting quarterback. I will be ready whenever you need me. He did just that. Unfortunately for Sean, Ty went on to have the greatest year of any sophomore quarterback in the NCAA history. Sean rarely got into a game again. Life in this instance was not fair to Sean. But he chose to do his very best and to, to, and to contribute to the success of the team in any way he could. He was, and is, a young man of faith, of righteousness, and of prayer, and with an eternal perspective on life. This is what helps him to make the right choices and to use each difficulty he encounters as a stepping stone to progress. The scripture continues, and take the helmet of salvation. Can you imagine how it would be to play a game of football without a helmet? It is the same in trying to live in this world of turmoil without the plan of salvation. Our understanding of this plan gives meaning to our lives, a knowledge of why we are here, and a hope for where we can be in the next life. The promise of exaltation and eternal families gives us a constant goal to strive for thus protecting us from and helping us avoid much of the evil that's out there in the world. Think of the amazing sacrifice the Lord made for us, that we might have salvation from Adam's transgression and from our own sins. Think of the intense suffering he bore at the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross in order to fulfill his mission on this earth. Think of the overwhelming love he must have had for us to have completed his earthly part of his ministry in such a way. It is the greatest gift that will ever be given. And we must use it daily to repent, to make wise choices, to always have that eternal perspective and to work toward exaltation. The last part of the protective equipment the scripture mentioned is the sword of my spirit, the most powerful part of our protective armament. The most powerful weapon we have against evil is the spirit of the Lord. He has promised us that we will have his spirit with us if we are trying to do as he has asked. With the Spirit, we know better how to use the rest of our armor to full advantage. As we do that, we can then fill the Spirit even stronger and exercise its power on a daily basis. Elder Lawrence C. Dunn in May 1979 Ensign expounded on this. We keep the commandments and teachings of the gospel in order to condition us spiritually. It is not a matter of how many laws we keep and how many we do not keep. We keep the commandments because they are the laws that govern the spirit. The spirit in turn will sanctify us, condition us spiritually, and eventually prepare us to live in the kingdom where God is. Close quote. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, the armor includes praying always. In the wars described in the Book of Mormon, it took a long time for the soldiers in the field to communicate with their leaders back at headquarters when they were in trouble, needed supplies, or guidance, or even to tell them of triumphs and victories. We, on the other hand, can have constant and instant communication with our leader, the Lord through prayer. Prayer is a stabilizing weapon we have against Satan. The more constant our prayers, the less opportunity there is for him to find a crack in our armor. Prayer is a special one-on-one, -on -one, soul-to-soul communication with our Heavenly Father. A time when we ask for help in our battles, small and large. 
It is also a time to thank him for his help as we safely come through each struggle, as he helps us keep our armor intact, as he blesses us while we are trying to keep progressing. One thing I had to learn the hard way was that prayer shouldn't be a last resort. Too often we depend on our own skills or the help of others, when prayer should be a part of every solution. Perhaps when we need him, he won't recognize our voice, as in this poem called Answered Prayer that someone sent me. Jake the rancher went one day to fix a distant fence. The wind was cold and gusty and the clouds rolled gray and dense. As he pounded the last staples in and gathered his tools to go, the temperature had fallen and the snow was beginning to blow. When he finally reached his pickup, he felt a heaviness of heart. From the sound that the ignition made, he knew it wouldn't start. So Jake did what most of us would do if we'd have been there. He humbly bowed his balding head and sent aloft a prayer. As he turned the key for the last time, he softly cursed his luck. They found him three days later, froze in the cab of that old truck. Jake had been around in his younger days and done his share of Roman. But when he saw heaven, he was shocked. Why, it looked just like Wyoming. Oh, there were some differences, of course, but just some minor things. One place had simply disappeared, the town they call Rock Springs. The BLM had been shut down, and there weren't no grazing fees. And the wind in Rollins and Cheyenne was now a gentle breeze. All the park and forest service folks, they didn't fare so well. They had all been sent to fight some fire in a wilderness in hell. Though heaven was a real nice place, Jake had a wondering mind. So he saddled up and lit a shuck, not knowing what he had find. Then one day in Cody on a cold October afternoon, he seen St. Peter coming his way and knew he'd be there soon. Of all the saints that Jake knew in heaven, his favorite was St. Peter. This line ain't really necessary, but it makes good rhyme and meter. <laughs> so they sat and talked a minute or two, or maybe it was three. Nobody there was keeping score. In heaven, time is free. I've always heard, Jake said to Peter, that God will answer prayer. But the one time that I asked for help, well, he just plain wasn't there. Does God answer prayers of some and ignore the prayers of others? That don't seem exactly square. I know all men are brothers. Oft does he really reply randomly without good rhyme or reason? Maybe it's the time of day, the weather, or the season. I ain't trying to act smart, it's just the way I feel. And I was wondering, St. Peter, what the heck's the deal? Peter listened patiently when old Jake was done. There was a smile of recognition, and he said, Oh, you're the one. That day your truck, it wouldn't start, and you sent your prayer a-flying. You gave us all a real bad time with the hundreds of us crying. Ten thousand angels rest to check, rushed to check the status of your file. But you know, Jake, we hadn't heard from, you, heard from you in more than just a while. And though all prayers of believers are answered and God ain't got no quota, he just didn't recognize your voice and started some guy's truck in North Dakota. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's not always easy to recognize the Lord's blessings or his answers. But our faith in the Spirit can help us so. Each of us has our own individual journey to make in life. And it isn't always a smooth ride. But prayer can make it bearable and give us the strength to keep moving. In a speech in 19, at BYU in 1973, President Hinckley used a wonderful quote from 
Jenkin Lloyd-Jones, which says, anyone who imagines that bliss is normal is going to waste a lot of time running around shouting that he's been robbed. The fact is, most putts don't drop. Most beef is tough, and most children grow up to be just ordinary people. Most successful marriages require a high degree of mutual toleration. Most jobs are more often dull than otherwise. Life is like an old-time rail journey. Delays, sidetracks, smoke, dust, cinders, and jolts interspersed only occasionally by beautiful vistas and thrilling bursts of speed. The trick is to thank the Lord for letting you have the ride. Close quote. I would like to add one more item of protection to help us foil the adversary, that of surrounding ourselves with good people. Remember those special young men, the sons of Helaman? who had been taught by their mothers to have total faith in the Lord and come to the aid of their people in war. We never know when we are going to have a kink in our armor and need stripling warriors there who will help us, who will lift us, who will help us repair that crack. One of the most famous runs that Steve Young ever made with the 49ers was in the game where he lost his helmet. Did he stop to pick it up? No, he kept running. Down the field, full bore, leaving himself open to serious injury. Steve had a couple of kinks in his football armor. One, he didn't appreciate the wisdom of the slide, often playing like a blocker, taking on linebackers and trying to flatten them. And sometimes, actually, a lot of times, his shield, his pocket, was shattered and he was flattened by a 300 pound lineman. Fortunately, Steve had good people around him to help back him up, to help him replace his kinks, to help him evaluate and to repair his body, and to help him make wise decisions like retiring. <laughs> we all need our stripling warriors, family, friends, leaders who have high values, who are loyal and fearless in their righteous desires, who know truth and have immense faith. Hopefully, we can all be stripling warriors for others as they discover the cracks in their armor. When we take upon ourselves the whole armor of God, it is much like the football player going into a game with all of his protective gear on. It gives himself confidence and a freedom to play. Take off his helmet or his pads, and he will become tentative in his playing and will render himself ineffective. The struggle to find ourselves is very real, and that is why God has given us this armor, that we might recognize truth and understand ourselves, that we might have faith because of the gift of salvation, that we might attain righteousness to help us overcome the evils of life. If we don't use this armor we've been given, we will, like the football player, become tentative in our choices and decisions and leave ourselves open to the adversary. As a high school and college coach for close to 50 years, I have seen this tendency, evidence as we place limitations on ourselves more so than on those that are opposed by others. It may be because a lack of fear, or because of fear, a lack of self-confidence, or a lack of eternal vision. We were placed on this earth to be successful in all our chosen endeavors. I have a plaque in my office that says, success is a journey and not a destination. We don't become successful and then just stay there. We either move forward or backward. True success is measured by what we choose to do with our lives, not by how many yards we gain running the ball or how rich we are, or if we have a powerful position. Such measuring sticks are not eternal and can put kinks in our armor. 
they have the potential of having a negative effect on the way we perceive ourselves and our worth. President Hinckley said, the course of our lives is not determined by great us and decisions. Our direction is set by the little day-to-day -day choices that chart the track on which we run. Close quote. The armor of God we've been given is far more powerful than any earthly armor. I think of the story of David and Goliath. Goliath was not only huge in stature, but he was equipped with every conceivable armor then known. David, however, was warmed only with the armor of God and a slingshot. In 1 Samuel 17, verses 44 through 46, after being ridiculed by his opponent, then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Close quote. We face intimidations in many ways during our lives. It may be the bully in the neighborhood as we are a child or a powerful corporation as we strive to make our way up the business world. It may be through peer pressure. To be popular is to go along with the crowd, to really show your love. You have to give your all. To be competitive, you have to take steroids. It may be our neighbor's money and power, our lack of them. The armor of God can help us bring down any intimidator, no matter what weapons he is using. The armor of God gives us eternal perspective, the strength of faith, truth, prayer, and the promise of salvation. We never need be afraid to stand up for ourselves and our God if we are protected with this armor. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take upon you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. Close quote. It is my prayer that we will all put on the whole armor of God that we will work at maintaining that armor through good choices, faith, prayer, study, service, and relying on the Spirit. I pray that each of us will continually to be truthful, to know ourselves, our potential in the Lord's sight, and that through that sight find joy, peace, and success in our lives. It has been my great pleasure to be at this great university and to have a lot of many things happen to us that we never really intend on. It's been great, but the truly blessings that I have in my life have always been and always will be the testimony that I have of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my wife, Patty, and my children and these are my most important possessions, and I bear it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. For more information on this program, please visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This Brigham Young University devotional by Lavelle Edwards was given April 10, 2001.